like this could be like a mini sode. You could release this as like a separate series kind of a thing and then just incorporate that into the show. Because I already do yeah. have I made jingles for it, man. Yeah, I know. This is the A QAnon candidate is currently winning a congressional primary in Georgia. If she does win, she's actually the favorite to win. She would be the third QAnon candidate to win a congressional primary this year. One of them actually beat uh, a five-term incumbent in Colorado in a swing district, no less. One thing to, for like the QAnon people to be winning in like deep red seats. It's another thing for QAnon people to be like knocking off incumbents in swing seats. Well, I mean, that was kind of the Michigan dynamic. Basically, there is extremism at both ends. But this uh, this particular Colorado district, it's like a suburban district of Denver. It's like a suburb of Denver. The Denver Democratic Party is actually, part of their platform is like opposing capitalism. Because uh, three years ago, there was a hostile takeover by like leftists, uh, like socialists and communists who like took over like the Denver chapter of like the Democratic Party. I think it would be wise for us to study however the fuck they did that i would like to see that happen here it was amazing they like not only they took over like the local like denver democratic party but they passed a platform plank that like opposes capitalism like quite explicitly i think uh the exact wording was like literally like yeah we want to seize the means of production that's dope the Denver Democratic Party, everybody. Kennedy tonight in the uh, debate between him and Markey, he literally tried to be like, the promise of this country is that everyone has a shot to make ends meet. And then me being me, just, I like said out loud, like kind of annoyed, says the trust fund dipshit. Kennedys are like the royal family of Massachusetts. Which is amazing because half of them are addicts. Not that addicts are, you know, bad. It's just like the whole like Irish alcoholic thing. And then, like, driving into, like, a river. They do call it a family disease. It's still kind of nuts to me that, like, they're probably going to be, like, three QAnon, like, members of Congress by this time next year. One outlet has already called it for. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is very much in, explicitly in supportive of QAnon and believes that uh, there is a deep state out to get all of us. On the bright side, uh, Ilhan Omar has opened up a massive, uh, it's almost 17 point lead as like half of Hennepin County, which is basically almost the entire district has uh, just dumped its votes in. And she's now up like almost 17 points. Nice. The initial results were like kind of freaking me out. Cause like it was like the little tiny, like, like only a couple thousand votes in. It's like, oh, she's only up by a few hundred. And then this massive vote dump in. And now she's up by like 14 and a half thousand votes. Her district includes Minneapolis, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah it's Well, it's all of Minneapolis. Because Hennepin County is like the like city proper. Right. It's like Suffolk for Boston. Yeah, but whiter. Like way whiter. Like Hennepin County is like 60, 65% white. Yeah. I guess Boston is now more diverse than that. What about the other? There have been a number of prime primaries that were like entrenched Democratic Party machines were beaten by left-wing insurgents. There are actually a couple. One of them hasn't really been picked up by the, most of the press, even though it's like insane like how big it is. Uh, but the big one was obviously Cori Bush last week. She won 48.6 to 45 and a half. This is like her third try at federal office. She ran for the Senate Democratic primary in 2016. She got 13% of the vote despite only raising like seven grand, which is actually kind of impressive for a statewide race. She ran for this seat that she just won last cycle round. She only lost by like 20 points, which is, sounds like a lot, but not really when you could see the fact that during the entire campaign, she raised like a hundred grand. She had no like outside support. There were no prominent members of Congress supporting her like this time. There was no justice Democrats or corporate monopolies pack money dropping in in our behalf. There was no outside help. There were no endorsements. Just to her and a hundred grand, a lot of field organizing work, and she got like almost forty percent of the vote. This time around, she raised five hundred seventy-six thousand dollars. She got like three hundred thousand dollars in outside help from friendly left-wing political action committees, from like Justice Democrats, Medicare for All, brand new Congress. Uh, like in corporate monopolies pack, which is a new left wing pack formed by like Sanders staffers from the 2020 campaign aimed at like knocking off corporate Democrats. 
And she was also endorsed by Bernie Sanders, among others. And she knocked off basically Missouri's equivalent to the, to the Kennedy dynasty. That seat had been in the Clay family since 1969. And she won by like three points. Also, it's a big deal because Lacey Clay, not only was he on the House Financial Services Committee, which means that like his demise will uh, lead to left-wing members of that committee, like AOC, for example, to move up in seniority, but also because Lacey Clay was a, sh- a huge shill for the payday loan industry, which is ironic because you would think that a African-American member of Congress would not be so intent on getting into bed with an industry that fucks over his constituency so fucking hard. Because black people are the core demographic of like people that like payday loan companies prey upon and exploit the shit out of. Right. That dynamic is extremely unhealthy in the Democratic Party uh, because the black congressional caucus is arguably the most conservative caucus in the Democratic Party on a federal level. Actually, that gets to my next point about the caucus. Uh, the black caucus this, this year in particular has been throwing a huge fit because they are very upset. And I actually find it to be racist that black, younger black, more left-wing candidates are taking on their entrenched members. They, uh, they said it was racism that Cory Bush had the nerve to run against Clay, despite the fact that Bush is also a black person and actually a Black Lives Matter activist. But it's somehow racist of her to take on Clay, who is... 20 years older than her. What's even really more fucked up is that the Clay campaign resorted to sending mailers in which they had darkened Bush's skin tone to make it look like she's somehow darker skinned. It's like this whole other level of like racism for an entity that claims to be striving to make progress for the average black person of this country. The Black Caucus actually endorsed Elliot Engel over Jamal Bowman. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. So it's not racist to endorse the white guy over the black candidate, but it's racist if a black candidate runs against another black candidate. Uh, The first time I saw this was actually in Ohio earlier this year when Margaret Harper, she was like a very left-wing candidate who actually raised a fuck ton of money in a very short amount of time. She was very much in favor of Medicare for All, Green New Deal, higher minimum wage, and all these other great things. And the incumbent representative, uh, I think it was Joyce Beatty, she decried her uh, primary challenge as racist, even though, again, Morgan Harper, 36-year-old black woman, challenging like a 70-year-old black woman who's been in power for several decades. Somehow that's racist. Unfortunately for Harper and the left more broadly, her primary was like a week or two after the after Super Tuesday, like when the lockdown really started to happen. Like when shit hit the fan, it was like around St. Patrick's Day. That like Illinois primary, like that week where like every everything kind of hit the fan. And so turnout was super low and she only got like 36% of the vote. So we lost an opportunity to knock off a shitty Democrat. But hey, probably a uh, good staging ground for the next shot. Also another, an interesting thing out of Missouri, Medicaid expansion passed 53.3 to 46.7. This is an expansion of Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act because according to the Supreme Court, it was a violation of the state's rights to implement a expansion of Medicaid without the state's permission. Medicaid expansion under the ACA is being is conducted by state by state choice. And so these red states that like, obviously the state governments don't want to do that. So like it has to happen at the ballot. And it's been very effective the last couple of years. Like 2018, it, I know for a fact it passed in Idaho with like a, a resounding majority. Uh, there were a couple others, but I can't remember the top of my head. But in Missouri, it passed 53.3. And this will expand Medicaid eligibility to 217,000 low-income people in the state of Missouri. And in Tennessee, on August Thursday, August 6th, a DSA-backed candidate won the U.S. Senate Democratic primary, despite raising only $8,420. Her name is Marquita Bradshaw. She's an environmentalist by trade. She got 117,413 votes, which translates to about 35.5% of the vote. The candidate the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee endorsed, this guy James Mackler, he raised $2.1 million, spent a million and a half of it. He came in third in like a six race, getting 78,500 votes, which is like 23% of the votes. In the Washington 6th district, uh, a candidate I was really interested in, uh, Rebecca Parson. She was endorsed by the local DSA chapter. She was endorsed rather early on by former senator and presidential candidate Mike Gravel and the Gravel teams of, obviously, Gravel fame. She came in third. Gravel uh, gang! A, <laughs> she came in third in a three-way race 
in uh, Washington State has a blanket primary system like California's. She got thirty four thousand three hundred and sixty six votes. The pro uh, pro business member of the New Democrat coalition, who was the incumbent, Derek Kilmer, he actually proposed cutting Social Security, but still managed to get forty seven percent of the vote. Uh, there was a bright spot in Washington, though, because in the Washington tenth, the left is actually one of their candidates has gotten a spot in the general election. Is it Josh Collins? No, he got crushed. He, he ran in his seat. <laughs> I mean, I feel like he's kind of a huge reference. <laughs> I was going to get to that. So uh, this is a seat contested by 19 Democrats because it's actually an open seat being vacated by a another pro-business Democrat. So Beth Doglio was endorsed by Bernie Sanders and the Congressional Progressive Caucus, which is kind of rare because normally the Progressive Caucus kind of just like sits on its hands and waits for things to play out. And then the Progressive candidate they want loses because they're sitting on their hands while the Blue Dogs actually do something. They actually like changed course for once, which is a pleasant surprise. Their political action committee dumped 140 grand and uh, $140,000 in advertising in the district highlighting her support for Medicare for All. She was also endorsed by Bernie Sanders. She secured the second place spot for the general election. She got thirty-one over 31,000 votes, just under 15% of the votes. She also got support from a Medicare for All political action committee and the Sierra Club's political action committee. So interesting to see like a more establishment-ish like organ of the democratic ecosystem, if you want to call it that, like actually jumping in and backing a more progressive candidate. That concerns me a little bit because it seems like the Democratic Party really likes to co-op populist language right. Actually, if you let me get to the rest of this, it will be see, will be less concerning given who she's running against in the general. She's okay. running against another Democrat called Marilyn Strickland, who is the former CEO of the Seattle Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce. Strickland fought against the $15 minimum wage when it was passed in Seattle. She takes a lot of money from Amazon. And she also opposes both Medicare for All and the Green New Deal. Her opposition to the Green New Deal is why the Sierra Club is backing her primary opponent, Ms. Doglio. Joshua Collins, on the other hand, he ran as an independent. He got 2,387 votes, which is about 1.1% of the total votes cast. Hey, he's he's on the map though. Somebody rem- somebody voted for him. I mean, I was getting texts from his campaign for a while. Like, kudos, kudos to Josh Collins. It was a valiant effort. I'm not going to lie. It's probably going to annoy you and the other ultras who maybe listen to this. I thought he was kind of a mirage. He was a little bit, not, not much of a candidate. He was kind of there for his own ego. Because he didn't really do much of, in the way of organizing. Sure, he had these like slick digital ads, but he didn't really like, do anything else other than that. Like, I, would, I don't disagree with him on policy. I just don't think he did enough organizing. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. He was kind of like a meme candidate. If he actually had a ground game, like a field operation to like, you know, organize, it might have gone something differently. He did the social media thing pretty fucking good, though. Like, I mean, most leftist candidates have got like the whole social media thing down these days. Yeah, I got like Gravel vibes from his quote unquote campaign. Really, it was just like his Facebook page. But yeah, exactly. I am very fond of the Gravel vibe in particular. Like, yeah, man. I was because he knew. I think he knew he wasn't gonna win. Too, I liked, but he just wanted to get the fucking issues out. There. I liked like, Michaela. That's part of why I like really liked Michaela Wilkes' campaign because one of the Gravel teams was like her foreign policy advisor on that campaign. Ah, uh, that makes sense. That's why I was so into Michaela Wilkes. It's like, come on, one of the Gravel teams is literally like advising her on the campaign. I'm surprised she didn't do better than she did, yo. I mean, yeah, there was a lot of pushback against her campaign, but like, she was a good fucking candidate. She was. She interviewed well. She was on point with issues. Absolutely. I think it's just a mountain of money and also like the machinery that like Hoyer was able to like bring to bear on her. Right. Steny Hoyer is like a fucking, oh my God. So he reminds me of like Mike Bloomberg. Oh, absolutely. He honestly, like, like physically kind of resembles him a little bit. Like, somewhere between, like, Mike Bloomberg and, like, a white Dracula. Shit. I can't put that in post because it's an image. But imagine, listener. Imagine. All right. It's kind of like how uh, Mitch McConnell looks like uh, either Kermit the Frog or a turtle, depending on how you're feeling that day. I still love the nickname Cocaine Mitch from Dunk like, and Chip from two years ago. That guy's a fucking idiot. That guy interviews <laughs> terribly. That guy is, yeah. like, he's probably the, I don't think I've ever seen a worst congressional candidate like actually it's funnier because he like started his campaign a month after he got out of federal prison for being for his responsibility in a in a federal case involving a massive mining accident yeah one of his mines collapsed 
And then like he a month blamed after he gets, the fucking miners for it, yeah. Like a month after he gets out of prison, he launches his campaign. He gets like twenty percent of the primary vote. His even his ads were terrible. Yeah, they were very they were very sloppy. It, if, it honestly felt like uh, his ads felt like like a seven year old was like trying to cut them. If somebody had told me that it was a parody, I would have believed them. It honestly did look like like it, the ads were made by like someone who just discovered what YouTube was. Who is that the the candidate from Georgia who is like oh Brian Kemp? Yeah, he's, Holy he's the governor shit. now. Yeah, his ads, his ads were oh, yeah, the one where, like, arguably more. He, he pointed more... like a lo- loaded shotgun at like a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> I am definitely putting his fucking ad in post, or at least part of it. Yeah, the audio version alone is just insane. I'm Brian Kemp. I'm so conservative. I blow up government spending. I own guns that no one's taking away. My chainsaw's ready to rip up some regulations. I got a big truck, just in case I need to round up criminal illegals and take them home myself. Yep, I just said that. I'm Brian Kemp. If you want a politically incorrect conservative, that's me. Unbelievable. Oh, right. Almost forgot. Can't can't forget that uh, Rashida Tlaib was renominated with like two thirds of the vote. Hell yeah. I mean, it almost like fell off the radar because like, yeah, she's going to kick ass because she always does. For fuck's sake, she represents Detroit. Like, people living there, like, understand how much capitalism sucks. Yeah, we I, talked. They, they, no part of America has seen as comprehensive a decline as the Detroit auto industry. I, I love that meme. I've been seeing it at, more lately on, like, social media. It makes me laugh, but also, like, it's a little sad because it's true. Like, that photo of, like, uh, like, like a libertarian on, like, Reddit. Like, oh, like, look at how, like, bad America, like, Cuba is. And, like, the photo on the left is actually Cuba. And the photo on the right is, like, downtown Detroit. It's, it's like, an Amer- a microcosm of America in general. We're all fucked. Yeah, they had, like, an extremely rapid population decline. All the white people left <laughs> yeah. is what fucking happened. All the white people left, dude. I'm not going to try and sugarcoat it. White people, man. (laughs) (laughs) I actually had that moment, which is hilarious, being like as pale as I am, saying out loud in that exact tone, like, ugh, white people. (laughs) And then me, like, realizing, like, I was right outside of Dunkin' Donuts, like, oh, wait a minute. (laughs) It still applies, but at least I'm cognizant of the irony of that. Yeah, dude, like, for all the stupid, like, numbers games that libertarians play, like, for being such a small portion of the population, white people have done a lot to fuck things up. A lot? That's an understatement. We've literally ruined the planet. Most. Most (laughs) most of the... It's nuts, but I understand why. Like, the amount of money that private equity dumped into this uh, race in Minnesota to knock off Ilhan. The dipshit, like, uh, piece of cardboard of a candidate that they propped up against her. He, as of July 22nd, he raised $4,153,879.76, had $695,172.09 cash on hand, and $75,000 in loans the campaign took out during this campaign cycle. Mind you, he jumped in the race like January. Meanwhile, since Ilhan Omar uh, raised during this campaign cycle, which she started raising money last January of 2019, she raised $4,281,487 with $732,446.38 cash on hand. So it took Ilhan Omar about a year and a half to raise $4.2 million. Uh, Milton Mukes raised $4.1 million in like four months. He is apparently, according to a quick Google search, a mediation lawyer, whatever the fuck that's supposed to be. I mean, it certainly helped in the APAC through their super PAC, uh, Democrat majority for Israel dumped quite a bit of money into his campaign. Because that was actually, right. that was Melton Mukes' big thing other than divisiveness is like, oh, she must be an anti-Semite because she opposes the oppression of the Palestinian people. Yeah, I think of all of all the Congress people, Ilhan Omar has the best foreign policy platform by far. Well, yeah, that's not even a question. I mean, again, lived experience trumps literally everything else. And the way she questioned, um, what was his now, name? Elliot Abrams. Abrams. Yeah. The way that she questioned him was... Superb. You should definitely get an audio file of that. In 1991, you pleaded guilty to two counts of withholding information from Congress regarding your involvement in the Iran Kortra affair. I failed to understand uh, why members of this committee or the American people 
should find any testimony that you give uh, today to be truthful. If I can respond to that. Uh, um, it wasn't a question. On February 8th, 1982, you testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee about U.S. policy in El Salvador. In that hearing, you dismissed as communist propaganda report about the massacre of El Mosote, in which more than 800 civilians, including children as young as two years old, were brutally murdered by U.S. trained troops. During that massacre, some of those troops bragged about raping a 12-year-old girls before they killed them. You later said that the U.S. policy in El Salvador was a fabulous achievement. Yes or no, do you still think so? From the day that President Duarte was elected in a free election, to this day, El Salvador has been a democracy. That's a fabulous achievement. Yes or no, do you think that massacre was a fabulous achievement that happened under our watch? That is a ridiculous question. and I Yes not or no? It. No. I, I I'm will sorry, Mr. Chairman. I will Chairman, take that I'm, as a yes. I am not going to respond to that kind of personal attack, which is not a question. Yes or no, would you support an armed faction within Venezuela that engages in war crimes, crimes against humanity or genocide, if you believe they were serving U.S. interests, as you did in Guatemala, El Salvador, and Nicaragua? I am not going to respond to that question. I'm sorry. I don't think this entire line of questioning is meant to be real questions, and so I will not reply. The question I had for you is, does the interest of the United States include protecting human rights and include protecting people against genocide? That is always the position of the United States. Thank you. I yield back my time. It's our finest export possible. That and whatever shit we send through USAID, which is clearly a front for, like, the CIA. But they still couldn't fucking get Castro. <laughs> no That's my favorite. What they tried. <laughs> it's my favorite story, actually. Like, uh, thing that, it's actually my favorite thing as a leftist to talk about, and I like annoy, I like to annoy my family, my liberal family, with talking about this all the time. Because, like, for example, my grandfather gets triggered if you just say the word Cuba. It doesn't necessarily need to be in the context of a sentence. So imagine how well he handles it when I love to, like, constantly bring up the fact that the CIA tried and failed over 900 times to kill Fidel. And he died of natural causes at, like, 96 after being praised by the Pope and personally visited by him. They failed yeah. that many times. Also, like, Abrams is actually still relevant. That hearing happened while he was, like, the quote-unquote envoy to Venezuela while we were in the process of trying to overthrow the government quite publicly. But Abrams has now been appointed the quote-unquote special envoy to Iran now. Two years ago, he was the special envoy to Venezuela. Now he is the special envoy to Iran. Oh, and another news, I just I just updated. The QAnon candidate just won the primary runoff in Georgia. The next representative for Georgia's 14th congressional district will most likely be Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is a very staunch supporter of QAnon. That makes her the third QAnon supporter to win a congressional primary on the Republican side this year alone. See, the thing about this that I still can't fucking understand, it's like, what ha- like nothing is going to fucking happen. Like, the QAnon candidates remind me of, like, those cult leaders that say like there's going to be an apocalypse on such and such date and then nothing happens <laughs> and then they have to like make a new date like how do how do the QAnon representatives get away with that shit i can't really understand their thought process because to do that i'd have to be like somewhat unhinged well there's still there there has to be at some point during donald trump's reign as king pepe he has to somehow oversee the mass rounding up and prosecution of a bunch of pedophiles but like that clock is ticking down if he doesn't get a second term then they don't have a platform really i mean it's not entirely out of the possibility that trump tries to stage coup because like i mean liberals don't really have much of a spine they're gonna do what they did when like in 2016 the, lib- the libs are gonna go to the courts and like try to win the court of public appeals while like the republicans actually like win the power by you know actually trying to manipulate the the levers of the machinery of the state in the correct way in order to facilitate their grip on power. Well, Democrats are not really going to do anything about it. I didn't realize how important the Postal Service conversation was in regard to the election. Yeah, like I somehow didn't make that connection when we were talking about it, but that would be the most totalitarian way to He's like it, he's he's pretty explicit. He's been pretty explicit the last couple of days like, yeah, I'm ordering like my postmaster general who was before 
becoming the postmaster general a month ago was like a donor of mine. Like, yeah, we're, we're trying to cause the post office to break down as soon as possible in an effort to slow down or potentially disenfranchise mail-in ballot voters. I mean, sure, destroying the post office has been the GOP's dream for about 20 years because we've talked about this in the past on the show. God forbid we allow a public service to exist because it shows... It provides an example that there can be others. I like to quote Doug Henwood, even though I don't always agree with him. He still is a great leftist. And even though he is quite old, you know, old for Twitter, he still amuses me. Uh, he had this like, almost like a rage post directed at The Economist this week. It's like, it's a public fucking service, you Philistines. About this uh, headline from The Economist about like, oh, well, the post office does well despite like losing billions of dollars. Who the fuck cares? As the French call it, it is service public public service so who the fuck cares how much money is it making it's not supposed to make money and they still somehow i mean at least before the pandemic managed to come out on top actually they were arguably the best uh, most effective postal system in the world not only do they have like the obviously the most egalitarian because many countries have private since privatized their systems but the postal system is public it has a legal obligation to uh deliver to every address in the country regardless of whether or not it's convenient or not Unlike others, cough, cough, UPS, FedEx, Amazon. The post office is definitely the best thing in the Constitution. Uh, they have a legal monopoly on the post, like the mail itself. But they're also incredibly efficient at what they do. Despite the fact that, like, due to political considerations, obviously politicians have been trying to destroy it for a couple of decades, and yet it still runs very effectively. Better than most. I don't remember what you said. Whatever it was reminded me of um, that excerpt from Noam Chomsky's What Uncle Sam Really Wants. It's on the Chomsky website, but it's titled The Threat of a Good Example. One of the paragraphs from the, the excerpt reads, In other words, what the U.S. wants is stability, meaning security for the upper classes and large foreign enterprises. If that can be achieved with formal democratic devices, okay. If not, the threat to stability posed by a good example has to be destroyed before the virus infects others. That's why even the tiniest speck poses such a threat and may have to be crushed. Right now, that's the, the post of service. That Chomsky absurd is literally a perfect uh, example, like a description of the Biden campaign. Well, like not giving an inch, because if you do, then fucking people are going to start asking for shit that will actually help them. No, well, yes and no. Yes, in the sense of, like, kind of. No, in the sense of, like, the Biden campaign is predicated on bringing back normalcy or, like, stability to the United States. Stability for who? Like, things sucked before Trump for the average pro in this country. We're bringing normalcy to the upper middle class suburban white people who go back to brunch well and also the the aggressive foreign policy we're we're going back to having not care about domestic politics while we rain death from the skies on brown people across the across the globe our listeners can go to chomsky.info slash uncle sam 01 and read that excerpt for themselves but the biden campaign i think mirrors pretty literally the uh aggressive foreign policy stance as a a mechanism of to sort of clear from the American conscience the idea that some other economic system, if it works in a country that isn't as wealthy as ours, we could also do that here. Like Cuba, Vietnam, they're examples of like successful, well, non-commodified economic systems of order of a society. For sure. And if countries like Cuba and Vietnam, which are infinitely less wealthy than we can, have infinitely less means than we have, as the supposed wealthiest country in the world, be still the very beating heart of global financial capital itself, then like, why can't everybody else do it? If Vietnam, which has spent most of the 20th century being fought over in destructive wars that have like ruined the entire country, several times over, for most of that century, can pull off a successful social society. Why the fuck can't we? We have a $20 trillion economy. We are the global heart of capitalism to which literally all of our money, all of the exchange rates and basically everything is pegged to our money. So realistically, we could do whatever the fuck we want, but we choose not to. And to have an example such as that exists is a very dangerous thing for the masses. It might have even been our first episode that I gave some metric for COVID deaths. 
I said COVID cases, and I was going to issue a correction. Vietnam still, even though they've had a, I guess you could call it a minor resurgence, or just basically just some some yeah, it was like a small handful of people. COVID again. Uh, they still have zero deaths. Meanwhile, um, as yesterday, the United States surpassed five million cases. Right, and we have globally, probably two hundred thousand deaths. Globally, there are twenty million cases in the United States alone. There are five million cases, and in the last two weeks alone, a hundred thousand school children have tested positive for COVID. But sure, let's send all of them back to the salt mines. Cough, cough. I actually in school, but the CDC is reporting at least two hundred thousand excess deaths in the United States. There's also an inc- a decrease in deaths. Um, that could be factored in due to the fact that less people are going out, like less people are driving, less people are engaging in unsafe behaviors or are in unsafe work environment settings. Like there's less construction. I'm, I'm, less, there's- I'm less skeptical of that because in my own experience the last month or two, looking through my social media feeds, actually, I think the opposite is happening, at least here in Massachusetts, where things have reopened. Like it, it, it does scare me a bit, like, how comfortable people seem to be with like going to restaurants again. Whichever way you look at it, unemployment has skyrocketed. So we still have the those... worst unemployment rate of any state in the country. <laughs> so all those people that were working and were regularly traveling and, you know, our workplace standards in this state, like, yeah, we have OSHA, but it's really not as great as the dudes on Capitol Hill would have you believe. Of course not. I mean, if you're like a pizza guy. <laughs> they need to they need to make OSHA sound, sound great so that they don't actually have to feel called from constituents. Why aren't you protecting us? I think logging is the most dangerous profession you can have. Uh, in terms of deaths, in terms of injury, illness rates, it's actually working in a warehouse. Oof. And Oof, Jeff as, Bezos. As, as someone who actually worked in like warehouses for UPS, I can attest to that. It is brutal as the labor statistic numbers bear out. You may not die as often as a coal miner or a logger, but like the injury illness rate is much higher. I'm just letting that sink in a little bit. It's nuts, right? And warehouse jobs pay like minimum wage at best. So you're basically being paid like crumbs for like what is essentially amounts to like slave labor for the amount of wages you are receiving in return and a lot of people are contracted because they don't work directly for the company that they're storing materials for my uh assessment of like basically being slave labor that applies to like the unionized warehouse workers as well ups warehouse workers they're unionized represented by the teamsters they're making as the most recent contract they're making like 13 bucks an hour which is like 25 cents above the state minimum for backbreaking work and extreme heat. I mean, it's a small victory, sort of, but you could say, like, at least they get health health insurance. It's not the best. <laughs> I know. It's I'm trying to be optimistic. Blue... I'm trying to it's be blue... optimistic here, Joe. It's Blue Cross Blue Shield. They're not that great. They're not. I had them. They were horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so you make, like, 13 bucks okay. an hour. You get wages taken <laughs> out. You get, like, withholdings taken out of your paycheck to get, pay for Blue Cross Blue Shield, really. Also, I have to say for any of our listeners who don't have public health insurance, it is fucking awesome. I love having Medicare. It's great. My co-pays are pretty much non-existent. For some reason, I haven't had to pay any money for medications. I don't know if that's like a mistake in the system, but I've been able no, to get Medicare all my meds covered for free. prescriptions. It was literally the only good thing George W. Bush ever did in his life. Because oh, oddly Jesus. enough, oddly enough, Medicare Part D was actually his thing. Well, I still don't. Un- I still don't understand why. Because like it pissed off right his, twice a day. It pissed off his entire party, and like he had to get votes from only the Democratic Party in Congress to get it through. Anything else in the notes, Joe? You know, I you keep telling you keep hyping me up about public health insurance, so I don't want to get too excited because I will be applying for Mass Health uh, in exactly two years from next week. Ooh boy! When I turn twenty six, because my birthday is next Tuesday, that will that will mean that I have two years left on the clock before I get kicked off of my Mass Teachers Health Association negotiated plan. My mom oh, sure. we'll, we'll be able to wish you a happy birthday in the episode next week. Yeah. Hell yeah. I think that'll do it for the electoral epoch this week. Indeed. Um, it's good and bad, I guess. Ilhan gets renominated, but like a QAnon freak wins. Uh, a, Senate, uh, a House primary runoff. I don't know. My expectations for electoral politics right now are like trash can. So I can feel that. I I've literally been having like the nihilism argument with like my par- my family the whole day, where they're like, "Oh, like isn't like Kamala great?" And like my my mom was complaining about how my brother like doesn't want to vote, and I can understand why. Like if it wasn't for like ranked choice voting and like the other good ballot questions we have here this year. I wouldn't bother voting in the general. 
It's not worth it. <laughs> do we want to do we want to talk about Alex Morse and the scandal around his campaign? Sure, you can talk. I don't I don't know enough about it to talk about it. Uh it's kind of weird. Uh, last week, the mass it, it was first dropped, first reported by the Massachusetts Daily Collegian, which is basically like a newspaper about like the basically like a college paper out in Western Mass. The college Democrats in Massachusetts have disavowed their groups from uh, Alex Morse. Uh, They're banning him basically from their meetings in the future because he's basically been using meetings of the uh, college Democrats to troll for, like, sexual partners. It's like 13 stepping at a fucking recovery group. He is. It gets worse because of the fact he's mayor in a college city, and he's also a, and he was also a adjunct professor at UMass Amherst from 2014 to 2019. Cool. And so it's relevant because he's running against the he's running in the Massachusetts First Congressional District on September 1st primary, and he's running against the sitting uh, chairman of the House House of Representatives Ways and Means Committee, which is basically one of the more one of the most powerful committees in Congress, which their portfolio is largely like the tax writing bills. Basically, any any major like domestic policy bill, like say Medicare for all example, would have to go through the, the Ways and Means Committee at some point. And Neil is pretty shitty, even for like the standards of a corporate Democrat, big time like shill of the hospital associations, pharma, health insurance industry, basically any kind of blood money kind of entity or enterprise involving healthcare, he probably takes money from them. He's also a show for the banks. Last year, he killed a bill that actually had bipartisan support and the blessing of the president, which is a very rare situation that would have ended a practice known as surprise building. You know, like if you go to the hospital and you like you get hit with like a surprise bill, this bipartisan legislation would have actually banned that. And he managed to kill it at the very last possible second at the insistence of one of his donors. The Morse thing is a problem because, like, it now creates a Sophie's choice of, like, well, you've got this really shitty guy, but you've also got this guy who claims to run on a progressive platform who's also apparently kind of a perv. The students that he's having relations with are put in a power dynamic that is very, very lopsided and makes, obviously makes people uncomfortable. Apparently, this is more of a hot button issue than I realized when the Merrimack Valley DSA chapter put out a statement condemning this uh, kind of conduct. And it was lambasted, derided, and basically chided as being prudish by like prominent figures on the left, such as Ryan Grimm and Glenn Greenwald being like basically you're being libs which is strange because you would think that like the left should be holding calling out shit like this but I guess it's turned which is, into this. Which is strange because they're, they're kind of libs. It's even stranger because like Glenn Greenwald is very prominently like an open gay guy. You would think that like he would take issue with like a pro- another prominent gay guy doing like shady shit like this. I could be wrong, but what I know well, is a stri- straight white guy. I mean, look at the fucking Ellen DeGeneres debacle. Being like the lesbian Amy Klobuchar, but for day- daytime TV, is is one thing. <laughs> Having like relations with your students <laughs> is like another thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck! I feel like we should end it there. That's great. Be- that sl- slash being like buddies with a war criminal, i.e., George Bush. Thank you, Joe, for your research, for sharing with us the uh, <laughs> the tenuous state of American politics and electoralism. What the hell else is new? In, it, it's it's um, exhausting sometimes, like having to reconcile, having this conversation with like more like ultra types on the left of like electoralism. What do you call me an? Ul- I'm not calling you. you. Call I'm, I'm talking more generally because I've had this conversation with other people on the left who are like. Aren't ultras like trots? Like yeah, like, that like, yeah, kind of. I wouldn't say you're an ultra. You're definitely not an ultra because you definitely got more pragmatism than like the kind of leftist I'm talking about. Like I like a true believer in the inside outside strategy, like doing electoralism and like doing direct action and mutual aid and trade unionism. Like we got to be push. As Lenin put it, I'm paraphrasing. I'm probably gonna butcher this. How uh, Lenin said at one point that we must contest capital in all spheres of power. It's not enough right. to just attack capital from one one angle of attack, because then we're, they're going to probably try to block off that action. So we got to keep coming from all directions. Just because electoralism is inherently rigged against the left, obviously, because we are a threat to the class hierarchy that is currently entrenched, doesn't mean we should take our Paul, go home, and just 
sit on our hands and do nothing. Yeah. At the very least, we should. At the very least, electoralism provides an opportunity to massively shift the Overton window in a rapid amount of time. Yeah, or you could get an AK forty-seven. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I. I can. I could never host this show, Scott. <laughs> Scott, hats off to you, man. We miss you. Oh, I. I. I would just love to see Scott's reaction to that. <laughs> well, I'm gonna post it, dude. No, I'm to like. Post no, it. like to to me to that plus me like kind of shrugging while taking a swig of my beer. <laughs> Being yeah. like, I'm not gonna argue with that. All right, Joe. So where can people find you? You can find me on the internet. I'm on Twitter sometimes, and I'm on Instagram. Shouldn't be too hard to find me. And I'm Jesse. You can find me nowhere except Facebook if you can figure that shit out. And uh, SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash Boston. Also, remember, go to comrade-rosie.org for resources in the greater Boston area. This has been the Electoral Epoch. See, Internet, I'm sure people can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy your epoch. <laughs> <laughs>